Okay. So let's get to the mechanics of the dislocation. Right? We have a distortion of our crystal, and that distortion of the crystal is going to cause an uh, elastic field. Right? There's a strain field and a stress field associated with that with the dislocation. So if we start with a screw and we have our dislocation line parallel to the z-axis and we define theta, an angle in the xy plane, we can define our dislocate our displacements in the z direction as a function of theta, right? When theta is zero, our displacement is uh, zero. As we go around, our displacement is going to, when theta is equal to two pi, our displacement equals one Burgers vector. So we can write our displacements as b theta. We can then change that to position x1 and x2. By our conversion from polar to uh, uh, Cartesian coordinates, right? It gives us the inverse tan of x2 by x1. So those are displacements. We can then in a pretty straightforward way, go from displacements to strain, assuming small strains. All right, and so we have a strain field. Uh, there's no strain in the uh, 1, 1, or 2, 2 direction. We have a shear strain in the 3, 1, and the 3, 2. Or we can write it in terms of a theta z. Uh, coordinates, so we only have two non-zero strain terms. We can then, if we assume uh, isotropic elasticity, we have a stress term that looks like this in Cartesian coordinates or this in uh, polar coordinates. Right. So it's pretty straightforward to compute the stress and strain field for an edge dislocation. You should try and work through it uh, by yourself. It's in the reading, but again, you should try and work through it uh, by yourself. Um, calculating the stress field around an edge dislocation requires a slightly deeper treatment of classical elasticity theory than we went into. Um, we have to assume most of the time you assume a, a uh, airy stress analysis and we can and if we def we can write our airy stress function. It's not too difficult um, if you have that uh, background from uh, if you ever took a class in uh, the theory of elasticity. If you're interested, it's gone through in detail in the in uh, Hearth and Lotha uh, theory of dislocations, and a lot of other dislocation texts. Um, but the stress field uh, uh, has a form that that looks like this. You don't have to memorize this, but you should know basically which terms. Uh, are important. Now what you see is the components of the stress, right? The the state of the stress that you see is very different as we move around the dislocation, right? This gives the normal, right? We don't have any out of out of plane uh Uh, stresses but you can see that the 
uh, x component and the y component and oh shoot i just saw a typo this should be x y all right this is the shear stress and you can see that how the shear stress and the normal stress components vary in sign as you move around the circle Okay, so that strain field has a strain energy associated with it. Right? Remember, we defined our strain energy density to equal one half uh, sigma ij epsilon ij, or one half the double contraction of stress with strain. We can replace stress with our stiffness times our strain. So this is nothing but our stress. Um, and if we evaluate this and then this is a strain energy density so to get the total en energy of the dislocation we have to integrate it we're going to integrate it from some around a screw to some from some region r0 out to r1 right we can't integrate it from zero out because we have a um, singularity at the core, right? When we reach the dislocation line, we've got a singularity. So we need to move some distance away from the core. Um, and so this is neglecting the core, the core energy here. Uh, but if we do that, we end up with a dislo the energy of a dislocation is going to, it's going to be proportional to GB squared over four pi. We do the same thing for the edge dislocation. We still have GB squared over four pi with a, a one minus the Poisson's ratio. So this is about going to be about 0.6 for most metals, 0.7 for most metals, right? So very similar to the energy for a screw dislocation, right? And so the exact form isn't important. What's important to remember is that the energy of a dislocation is proportional to GB squared, the shear modulus times the Berger vector squared. So this is if we think about what dislocations we're likely to see, we want to have dislocations that minimize our Berger's vector, right? Which basically means our close path direction, right? So slip is likely to occur in close path directions to minimize B, right, this energy. That's one of the reasons why slip occurs in closed pack directions. But from an energetic point of view, it's not that hard to, to deduce. So what are the implications of uh, the strain energy being proportional to GB squared? Well, the big one is, is partial dislocations, right? Dislocations, perfect dislocations don't always stay around. Right, so here we have in an FCC crystal our 101 type uh, dislocation, and it can dissociate into two part two one one two type partials, and this is going to happen energetically favorable if the energy of this dislocation. is more favorable is more than this system now when this happens in fcc you might remember you get a stacking fault right a a stacking sequence so instead of a b uh right we have an a site moves to uh, a, a b site moves to c site under the action of this uh, stacking in, in FCC, it's a little hard to describe for you non-materials people. I 
we'll talk about this in class, um, but I don't want to, didn't want to, to go into it in depth in, in, in the lecture part. Um, but basically, in FCC, we create this creates is going to create a stacking fault here. And so if the energy of this dislocation, the perfect dislocation, is greater than the partials plus the stacking, the energy of creating of the stacking fault, uh, then it's it's likely going to split. And these dislocations are going to maintain a separation that depends on the stacking fault energy. The stacking fault energy is very high. These partial dislocations are going to move close together to minimize the the amount of region that is is faulted. In metals where the stacking fault energy is very low, these partials will be uh, widely widely separated. And this leads to um, uh, can be seen in slip traces in crystals. Right when metals have a very low stacking fault energy, the part the di dislocations will tend to split into partials. And these partials, this might if this is a perfect screw, these partials now have edge character. They're not perfect screw anymore, so they can't cross slip. Right? So our partials are spread apart. They're going to move, but they cannot they can't cross slip to different planes. So you tend to have planar slip, long straight slip traces. In a metal with a high stacking fault like aluminum, right? Those partials either don't for, don't separate or they stay very close together. And so if the dislocation hits an obstacle, they can readily recombine and cross slip around those obstacles. So you get wavy uh, slip lines. And we'll stop there. And we're two thirds, well, three fifths of the way done. But the other two will be a little faster.